Hi, I'm economist Robert Murphy. In this lecture, I'm going to be focusing on the economic case for free trade and detailing the problems with so-called protectionist policies such as tariffs and quotas. I'm going to be focusing on chapter 19 of my textbook, Lessons for the Young Economist. And if you're interested, you can find the PDF of this free online. First, let's have a historical overview of the topic. From about the 16th to the 18th centuries, the dominant governments of the world were animated by the philosophy known as mercantilism. And the idea here was that the finance ministers would advise their rulers, the king or whoever it was, prime minister, so forth, and would say, what we need for our country to be prosperous is to have a so-called favorable balance of trade. Specifically, what that meant was that exports would be greater than imports. And the way you measured exports and imports wasn't in terms of the physical goods themselves, because what would it mean if you exported 10,000 bottles of champagne and imported 2,000 sweaters? How would you determine whether the exports were greater or less than? The way you would measure it is you would denominate everything in terms of money. And so back then, people were using hard money, like gold or silver. So let's just imagine everybody's using gold coins back then, and that's the form of money. So what it would mean if a country had a so-called favorable balance of trade where exports exceeded imports is that foreigners would be spending more total gold buying stuff from your people than your people would be spending gold on stuff made by foreigners. And so if your country had a favorable balance of trade, what that would imply is that there would be more gold flowing into your country than flowing out. So on net, your country would see rising balances of gold year after year, so long as it kept up with its favorable balance of trade. So you can understand why the finance ministers giving advice to their leaders would think that was a good state of affairs. At the household level, it certainly seems as if the way to get ahead financially, the way to increase your wealth year after year, is to sell more than you consume, right? to have a higher income than your consumption, and that that could manifest itself by more money coming into your household than goes out, and that your cash balances grow year after year. That certainly seems like a better policy than the reverse, doesn't it? And so it was only natural and intuitive that people would think that would generalize in the way a country got richer over time was by selling more stuff to foreigners than vice versa so that its stockpile of gold or silver would keep getting bigger and bigger year after year. And so governments would enact policies to try to encourage a favorable balance of trade. They would enact policies that would promote exports and would discourage imports. And so there were all sorts of different policies designed for these ends. Perhaps the government would give uh, subsidies to exporters so that foreigners actually could buy products that your producers made at a cheaper price because your own government was helping to defray the cost. Because again, the idea was we want to promote uh, the sale of our stuff to foreigners. And maybe they would enact taxes or other kinds of uh, restrictions on goods coming into the country. Because again, the idea was we want to discourage our people from buying stuff made from foreigners. We want our people, when possible, to buy local, to buy or you know, buy domestic. If they, they didn't use those terms, but that's the idea. And so I'm actually getting ahead of the uh, discussion here by using more modern parlance. Right, that if you, if you see where the mercantilists were coming from, notice that mentality survives to this day. The only real difference is that nowadays people, the, first of all, they don't call it mercantilism. Nowadays, a more modern term would be protectionism. But it's the same viewpoint that people think it's a good state of affairs when our country is exporting more stuff than we're importing. 
And the way we talk about it now is to use the phrase a trade deficit or a trade surplus. So again, it's this loaded language where, because the word deficit sounds bad. So if you have a trade deficit, that means that your people are buying more stuff from foreigners than vice versa. So there's a deficit that we're uh, spending more on their goods and services than vice versa. Whereas a trade surplus means when we trade with foreigners, we're selling them more of our stuff than, they're, uh, than we're buying of their stuff. And the other main difference is that nowadays, the primary justification for why we ought to have a trade surplus is that people think, oh, that creates jobs. They think it's good for jobs. So it's no longer thinking in terms of the accumulation of money, but rather we want to protect jobs here at home. And so the thinking is, well, gee, if, if we're encouraging foreigners to buy stuff that we make and our people are buying local or domestic, well, surely that promotes employment here. Whereas if, if our consumers switched and stopped buying from domestic producers and started importing stuff from foreigners, well, surely that would throw our people out of work. And that's a bad thing. Okay, so it's, the argument has shifted somewhat. It's no longer a focus on the accumulation of money. Now it's more um, designed to promote domestic employment. But other than that, the mentality is pretty much the same as the old mercantilist viewpoint. Most people just intuitively think that, yeah, you would want the government to set policies to encourage foreigners to buy stuff that our people make and to penalize our people, to discourage them from buying stuff that foreigners make. So it's, I mean, there, there's all sorts of explanations for why that is, what, why people should have this intuitive reaction. Certainly, it's a, a version of tribalism, just the idea that you trust your people more than outsiders. But it, there also is something more to it than just that. There is this uh, faulty economic logic that goes along with it. Okay, so that's what we're going to be tackling in this lecture. By the end of this, I'm hoping to convince you that that entire mindset is utterly, totally wrong and that the government does not make its people richer by enacting policies that arbitrarily or artificially promote exports and discourage imports. There are many different ways that economists have come up with over the decades or even centuries to illustrate the problems with the mercantilist or protectionist viewpoint. So in this lecture, I'm just going to hit on some of the major themes, some of the more popular examples or arguments to get you to see that. Now historically, the great contribution of the British classical economists, including people like David Hume, Adam Smith, and David Ricardo, the great contribution of these thinkers was to overturn the mercantilist viewpoint. So there were lots of problems with the classical economists' theories. In particular, they didn't have a very good explanation for the market value of goods and services. That was something that would come later. But be that as it may, the great contribution for which we must ever be grateful is that the British classical economists showed the problems with the mercantilist system. And they didn't just achieve this academically or convince some other thinkers. Their demolition of the mercantilist perspective was so comprehensive and devastating that policies changed. And for a while, at least, the British Empire was largely one of free trade. And that's partially responsible for what we might consider to be a golden age in many respects of the pre-World War I era. So let me just run through some of the main ideas to get you to see the problems with the mercantilist viewpoint. And a lot of this was covered in Adam Smith's famous book, The Wealth of Nations. And so right off the bat, just that title that he was inquiring into the nature of and the causes of the wealth of nations showed where he was going because Smith 
challenge the idea that the way a country becomes richer is just to accumulate more money. That even though that sort of makes sense at a household level, it doesn't generalize. And there's different ways to see that. Uh, David Hume had a, a good example of, of just walking through the logic of this. So uh, imagine you have two countries and there's a fixed amount of gold between the two countries, a certain number of gold coins. And the idea is if in one country uh, things just tend to be cheaper than in the other country, well, what's going to happen? People in the country where things are really expensive are going to want to import stuff from the cheaper country. And so goods will flow from the country that has low prices over to the country that has higher prices. And in the way that's effected is that gold ends up flowing from the high price country over to the low price country, right? Because on net, people where things are really expensive are going to be spending more gold importing stuff from the cheap country rather than vice versa. And so the only way that balances out in the aggregate is if on net gold coins end up traveling from the really expensive country into the pockets of people in the country where things are relatively cheaper. Remember, we're assuming a, an environment where people use gold as the money. I mean, you can have national currencies, but that they're tied rigidly to a fixed weight of gold. And so it's like everybody in the world is actually using gold as money. Okay, so in that sort of framework, what's going to happen? Well, Hume showed that, well, as the quantity of gold coins in the possession of people in the formerly high-priced country keeps shrinking because on net their gold coins are flowing into the pockets of the foreigners, well, the prices in that country can't stay at that high level. The, the domestic producers, the, the merchants and the, the farmers who are selling crops to their neighbors, the people making sweaters, people making wine and so forth, they can't keep charging the same amount measured in gold coins for their stuff as they did before because now the people in their country have fewer gold coins in their pockets. And so prices in that country are going to have to start falling. At the same time, what happens in the country that originally had really low prices quoted in gold? Well, now the people in that country see all these gold coins coming in year after year. And so that's going to eventually put upward pressure on gold prices in their country. And so this is uh, what was called the, the price species flow mechanism, if you want the technical term. But the basic idea is if you just think through. And of course, all these examples we're going to go over are very unrealistic and simplistic, but it's just to get you to see the logic of it and to see the forces at work to help clarify your thinking. And so if you have two countries with a fixed quantity of gold coins, you can see that there's going to be this natural equilibration process where you couldn't have a persistent trade deficit or surplus because eventually that would change the prices of goods in, in both countries such that the advantage would be removed. Okay, so that's just one example there. And so what this should get you to see is that when you're looking at the country as a whole, it doesn't generalize. It's not true that this the mere accumulation of money is a measure of national wealth because other things equal, if you just have more gold coins come in in people's pockets, that's just going to make the price of stuff quoted in gold go up. It's not that your people are going to actually get to eat more food or that they're going to live in nicer houses or that there's more clothing available. It's just that the, if the same amount of real stuff is produced year after year and people have twice as many gold coins, well, to a first approximation, that just means the price of everything quoted in gold is going to be twice as much. So you are a little bit better off to, in, the, in the sense that gold can be used for productive purposes. But in terms of gold just being considered as a unit of money, as a commodity that is used as money, it doesn't matter how many gold coins your people have. Prices would adjust so that the same real flow of uh, production occurs year after year. Okay, so that's one way to start seeing that, wait a minute, something's screwy with the mercantilist system. 
that if the government were successful in enacting policies that made it the year after year our people kept getting more and more gold coins that doesn't mean that our standard of living would actually rise it doesn't mean we would end up eating more food or that we would have more carriages or have more arable farmland it just means we would have more gold coins and that prices quoted in gold would be higher okay other problems with the mercantilist system it is a zero-sum game at best think of it this way that for the world as a whole the trade balance has to be zero right the, the world as a whole planet earth as a whole cannot have a trade deficit or a trade surplus you can get trade deficits and surpluses if you break it down at the individual level where you know one country can trade more with the rest of the world than it imports from them but the world as a whole obviously you know we're not trading with martians okay so what that means is at best only some countries could successfully implement mercantilist policies if some governments succeed in enacting a favorable trade balance then necessarily just by accounting there must be other governments that no matter what they do suffer from an unfavorable trade balance so if gold coins on net are flowing into the coffers of some countries that means gold coins on net are flowing out of the coffers of other countries okay so that's a way to see I mean that that by itself that observation by itself doesn't prove that mercantilism is wrong but it does show that it's a very dangerous philosophy because what it does is it pits all the governments against each other it creates an irreconcilable conflict where in order for one government to achieve with its economic policies it needs to force other governments to fail and so one government's success can only come at the expense of other governments and so it naturally creates hostility and in practice what that would mean is that the, the stronger countries the, you know, the governments with bigger armies and so forth would be the ones to be successful because they would impose their will on their weaker rivals so one of the benefits from the more uh, correct understanding of the economics which we'll get to in a, in a little bit here is that it removes this impetus to uh, conflict when you understand how free trade works that's something that everybody can participate in it makes everybody better off and so there's there is no conflict there's actually a harmony of interests okay so again that's not a strictly economic point but I just do want to make sure you realize if mercantilism were correct then it means everybody's in at best a zero-sum game